some other testimony that was submitted to the legislature earlier this week. I definitely need to get this testimony posted online for you because this is uh, this is a great read. Some very great information here, uh, and and actually it's the testimony of our guest who's going to join us here on the program here on Voices of Montana this morning, talking about the issue of unmanned aerial drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, whatever you want to call it. But uh, certainly we've all become familiar with UAVs and drones uh, that have been used overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, uh, of course, not only against uh, wartime and terror targets, but there's an increasing uh, use here domestically by UAVs. So uh, should there be limits placed on the government when it comes to the use of UAVs? What type of restrictions should be put in place? Uh, especially here in Montana. There's an actual bill that's been put forward uh, in the state legislature by uh, State Senator Robin Driscoll, a Democrat out of Billings, that would restrict the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. We've actually got the author of this legislation, Brendan O'Connor, a Billings native with an incredible resume and and a very intelligent young man. He's joining us today on Voices of Montana. We're going to get right to it right after we take this quick break here on Voices of Montana. Of course, we want to take your phone calls as well, 866 627 Back right after this. Uh, Back into the issues here, Uh, a a bill proposed by a legislator uh, out of Billings would restrict the use of unmanned aerial vehicles here in Montana, or drones as they're oftentimes referred to as well. I kind of, you know, lightly kind of joked on my blog when it was introduced, you know, imagine if a Republican legislator did this. Oh, they'd be called the crazy black helicopter community, et cetera. But but it's actually a bill being uh, introduced by a, a Democratic state senator out of Billings. Robin Driscoll, but the whole uh, actual bill actually was authored uh, by a young man named Brendan O'Connor, uh, and some of you in uh, you know northeast Montana might know him because uh, his mom, Teresa, actually grew up on her family's cattle ranch halfway between Culbertson and Bainville, and you might know his dad, Bill O'Connor, who's a, a prominent attorney in, in Billings as well. Well, well Brendan, uh, I was looking at his, uh, his bio here and his resume. I mean, we're talking about he got his undergrad degree, I think, in computer science. I was trying to find it for you here. Uh, a master's, I think it is, from, from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and literally, like, the Department of Defense has called on this young man to, to speak on some of these very complex, uh, detailed uh, discussions when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, uh, so, so he certainly got the credentials when it comes to this discussion. Brendan O'Connor, thanks for joining us on Voices of Montana. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's good to have you. Well, you know, what, what's your take? This is kind of an interesting issue, uh, the fact that it really unites kind of some on the left and on the right with concerns over civil, civil liberties. What are your biggest concerns? Right, well, I, I don't think it's really a normal partisan divide type issue. I think people both on the left and on the, on the right can find that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution is important, the right against, you know, unnecessary and um, in, and privacy invading search and seizure. Um, so I mean, when I, I wrote this this summer on behalf of the Rutherford Institute, which is a, a relatively conservative leaning constitutional civil liberties group out of uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and you know, they've taken on uh, issues relating to privacy and the First Amendment as well, um, on certainly on both sides of the aisle. And I would also you know, say that obviously you know, Senator Driscoll's support of a bill written by a conservative think tank demonstrates that, once again, this isn't a partisan issue. This is a whether you think the Constitution is important issue. Yeah, in fact, kind of a, a funny sidebar was uh, that uh, I had coffee with your dad, and he was mentioning how he ran into you know, former Senator Conrad Burns and a, f- a few other uh, conservatives downtown for coffee. And and, uh, and they said, oh, I, d- I didn't know your uh, son was a, was a big conservative. And they said, well, he's not necessarily. He just believes in civil liberties, and that's why he was authoring this legislation for the Rutherford Institute. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool little story. But uh, give us some of the details. What would Senate Bill 150 actually do? Because there are some positive uh, – Uses for UAVs here in Montana. You can map noxious weeds. You can uh, you could use it in support of firefighting efforts. Um, so so what what is it that SB 150 will and won't do? You're absolutely right that UAVs have a lot of positive uses, and I think this bill is pretty narrowly tailored to prevent the negative uses while allowing those positive uses, mapping weeds and helping fight fires that you mentioned. So SB 150 has essentially two major parts. The first part is that UAV collected footage, um, whether it was collected by the state of Montana 
or as has actually happened in several criminal proceedings proceeding, like happening right now in Montana, whether it was collected by the feds or the military and then turned over to the state of Montana, um, it can't be used in a criminal trial at all for any purpose, whether that purpose is as direct evidentiary testimony or for any other purpose. Um, the second part of the bill says that um, no governmental entity under the state, whether the state or local or sheriff's um, department, can use any anti-personnel device mounted on UAV, which does, I have to admit, as you mentioned earlier, sound a bit like the black helicopter community. Yeah, because when the you talk about is, anti-personnel device, what, what, are you, what are you referencing? I mean, obviously, I, we're not talking about a, like a predator drone strike where you've got – I mean, well, that could be one of them, obviously, as well. You certainly yeah, want to protect from that. drones but. are pretty anti-personnel, but I also mean things um, – there's and some of the things I linked to in the testimony include things like there's one um, gentleman, just a hobbyist, who successfully gotten a um, just a hobbyist drone costing less than a thousand bucks to uh, repeatedly fire a handgun and with pretty startling accuracy actually. I'm not sure I'd be this accurate with a handgun if I was actually holding it, let alone piloting a helicopter. Um, but then also the Department of Homeland Security has actually started purchasing teaser equipped uh, drones for use in the United States. Actually, there's a sheriff's department in Texas that has gotten one of the first ones, and that was actually in late 2011. Um, so this is the kind of thing that's already happening. There's not a huge amount of information about it because they haven't been deployed in any very high-profile situations. Well, and, and why is it, uh, you know, because part of the other side that I've heard of this, in fact, earlier this week, we had a former SEAL Team 6 commander uh, and, and state senator, Ryan Zinke, uh, who, who uh, you know, he, he's been very, very uh, involved in, in more of the kind of private sector UAV development because obviously we've got a lot of airspace here in Montana. And I know you mentioned that this bill doesn't block any, any commercial applications of UAVs. But, but, you know, one of the things he said is, look, this is just uh, UAVs are a tool, much like any other tool, you know, whether it's a helicopter. Or, or a gun, uh, and so it just comes down to the rules uh, that you use for, for where the limitations are. But but a UAV shouldn't be that scary to everybody. It's just a tool like any other. Well, the problem is um, that UAVs, you know, unmanned electronic data gathering systems generally are different than a normal helicopter piloted by humans and staffed by humans um, that you may have used before as part of Dev Group. And the reason for that is because they require no human interaction. So there's a finite number of law enforcement officers in the state of Montana who can there, therefore collect a finite amount of information. Um, when it, you can simply launch more drones into the air and collect an essentially unlimited amount of information, then there is no limit to how much private data on the citizens of Montana can be collected over time. And, and I've seen this if you look at the, the Ring of Steel in London. Yeah, let, let's hold it there for a second. Brendan O'Connor, author of uh, Senate Bill 150, being carried by S State Senator Robin Driscoll out of Billings. Um, we're going to hold it there. We've got to take a quick break. But you're talking about how you can identify faces over 19 square miles. Fred and Lockwood, you're up first with a phone call after this. Well, this discussion that we ended up getting into yesterday as it kind of was breaking uh, as we were live on the air, this discussion over, uh, you know, concealed weapons permits and the confidentiality uh, that should or or maybe in the newspaper's eyes here in Montana should not exist. And so that came up during the show yesterday. But but really this issue of, of confidentiality and, and all this information that's being collected by the government, where should the lines be drawn? Well, that's some of the questions that are coming up in this debate over unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. And should there be lines drawn uh, when it comes to the use of UAVs or drones particularly by uh, law enforcement or government agencies here in Montana in fact there's a bill by uh, Senate Bill 150 uh, being carried by State Senator Robin Driscoll, a Democrat out of Billings, that would restrict and, and limit the use of UAVs. And we've got the author of that bill. Uh, in fact, he authored it while he was working for uh, the Rutherford Institute, uh, Brendan O'Connor, uh, who's, uh, uh, as some of you may know his father, a uh, prominent Billings attorney, Bill O'Connor, who's joining us on Voices of Montana this morning to talk about this. Uh, we're going to, in fact, we're going to take your phone calls because I know you've got some interesting questions and comments you want to throw out there as well. Uh, write the phone number down, 866. Six six two seven five four eight three to join in on the discussion. Fred is in Lockwood, and he's going to be first up right after we hear 60 Seconds Around Montana with Brian Bennett. And today's Montana News Minute is sponsored by Cloud Peak Energy, energy to power the country. 
All right, we're back with Voices of Montana. Uh, and so should there be limits, should there be restrictions put in place here in Montana on what the government and law enforcement uh, can do with UAVs or these drones and, and how they can use any information obtained uh, from drones in a court of law uh, as evidence? That's just some of the questions that we're talking about this morning here on Voices of Montana. Uh, in fact, and we've got the author of Senate Bill 150 uh, joining us here on the, on the program. I know we're trying to switch him over to a different phone line uh, to get a little bit uh, clearer audio, so we we might lose him for just a couple of minutes. But either way, we've got Fred and Lockwood calling up uh, here to join in with questions or comments. Uh, he's on line two listening to KYYA. Fred, thanks for your phone call. Yeah, well, as far as calling it law enforcement, I sure hope you're not talking about the Billings Police Department because they not only enforce laws, but they're very much involved in crime prevention and in uh, – actually creating laws, two things I don't think they should be into at all. Um, but you're right about the drones being a tool, and the Billings Police Department has a history going way back of misusing their tools. Just recently, a young baby girl was burned when they lobbed a grenade into a house that they thought was a meth lab and no arrests were made. Um, another guy was killed. He was a criminal, no doubt about it. But, I mean, they, not only do they do the enforcement and prevention and all that, but they also, I think, exact uh, sentences on people. This guy was killed as he was going away from them trying to escape. I mean, well, this w- wasn't this the guy who was control, trying to – wasn't, think- wasn't this the guy who was trying to – I mean, in, in, in BPD's defense on that, I mean, wasn't this the same guy who tried to run over a law enforcement officer, I, I, if I remember correctly, on, on that story? I don't story? know why well, you'd see the need to try to defend him pers- you personally yourself, but – Watch the video. I've, I've met many fine police video. officers. I've heard, I've heard the spin, but watch the video. All right. All I'm right. all for police officers, but I am 100% against law enforcement run amok, and that's what we've got here. We don't need more tools for them to do it. All right. Well, Fred, appreciate your phone call, and I, and I know there, there's folks, you know, a lot of folks who say, look, there's many fine members of the Billings Police Department, and, and uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's there's legitimate concerns about any uh, law enforcement agency, uh, whether whether you, you like them or don't like them. There, there's concerns about where lines should should be when it comes to collecting information on the citizens. Uh, so, Fred, appreciate your phone call. Uh, uh, Brennan O'Connor, I think we still got you with us here on, on a different phone line. So, yeah. uh, um, any reaction to Fred's call? Um, well, I think Fred underscores an important point. If you listen to the testimony that was before the Senate Judiciary Committee the other day on uh, Monday, actually, um, you hear an interesting problem. Um, a law enforcement agency in northeastern Montana actually uh, had the United States government do the military drone to overfly a ranch to see if certain vehicles were present on the ranch anywhere in the area. Um, of course, without a warrant. And then, having determined without a warrant that the vehicles were there, they then, without a warrant, invaded the ranch and presumably seized the vehicles or did whatever other actions they felt necessary. So, again, we see this, you know, as another tool, indeed, being used to allow law enforcement to run them up. And it just seems like, you know, allowing this sort of action to be taken without even a single human presence allows even greater invasion of our civil liberties. And in fact, uh, one of your bullet points from your testimony talked about current UAV technology that allows every face to be seen and identified across more than 19 square miles simultaneously from an aircraft at 20,000 feet. And you, you add that yep. this technology can be used to track every movement of every person, even in Montana's largest cities. Uh, well, let's get yep. to some more phone calls here as we talk with Brendan O'Connor and talking about a bill that would limit the use of UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles here in Montana. Uh, Keith is in Fortine on Line 3 listening to KJJR. Good morning, Keith. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I remember last summer uh, there was some discussion concerning drones, and uh, it concerned the uh, elimination of wolves. And they, <clears throat> the, uh, the drones were to be armed with um, firearms that could um, – Kill the wolves uh, as they were uh, spotted from from a drone, and these uh, these firearms were aimed by some kind of a device on the drone that could uh, take out a particular wolf or a, a group of wolves. And as I remember, uh, during the the course of that discussion, uh, you were in favor of such. Um, 
a program. And I, at the time, I thought. Oh, me? Oh, I think I, I remember that. I mean, th- I think we were more joking around about that. You know, I think well, I made a joke about, well, hey, you know, if you're one of those uh, ranchers who has a concern about wolves, you know, hey, maybe, maybe that's a way to. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's a, you, you could say that. It's a, more of a joke, and some might consider poor taste. Well, but <laughs> you got to lighten know, up every now and then. It didn't sound a whole lot like a joke to me. It, it was um, more or less a, a serious uh, concern that I had. I was driving at the time and, and didn't have uh, access to a phone, and I, I would have called in at that time and expressed my concern, but it looks like this thing is raising its ugly head again, and if if these drones are armed with uh, uh, some sort of a firearm device, which would most likely be uh, an automatic sort of situation, uh, I, I'm really concerned about the the drones uh, surveillance of us here in Montana, yeah, and the the way that uh, we could be uh, looked at, and even if if the law became uh, if this bill became law, it would prevent uh, a drone from actually coming down and taking aim on a suspect that. Uh, uh, the law might be interested in. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and and there's lots of us who share those concerns about about confidentiality and, and other uh, civil liberties, and that's why we're having this discussion today. So, Keith, really appreciate your phone call uh, on this this thought of you know wildlife officials potentially using it to control uh, wolves that are, that are or other uh, you know predators that are targeting uh, livestock, for example. Uh, as we talk with Brendan O'Connor, Brendan, what's your thoughts? I mean, it certainly sounds like it's cer- something that certainly is plausible, something that could happen. Now, politically, they might not be able to do it, but is there anything that would prevent wildlife officials from doing something like that? Not in this bill, Aaron. Um, the bill specifically says, you know, anti-personnel, and it defines this mean against humans. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have, you know, civil rights for trials for wolves, um, or perhaps not that unfortunately if they're attacking your cattle. So, no, there's nothing in this that would prevent the uh, fish and game people from using this to do legitimate animal control. Uh, just then taking the legitimate control and saying, oh, by the way, we found a hunter, and we're not sure he's in season, so we're going to drag him in and arrest him and then determine if he has any rights left. Yeah, yeah, and that's certainly where we cross the line. So so bottom line, if, if, if you're worried about uh, drone strikes on wildlife, you'll have to carry that in another bill, but this one's focused on the civil liberties of, of uh, Montanans. All right, uh, let's see, oh, You know, only about 30 seconds before we've got to take a quick break. Then we've got Dean in Big Fork and then Phil after that, and the phone line open at 866-NBS-LIVE. Uh, Brendan, about 20 seconds left. Uh, anything you want to say about this bill before we come back for more? I think the bill makes a nice divide between necessary uses for fish and game, as you've mentioned, or for business uses. Like I mentioned, real estate agents who want to take photos of houses, and yet also protecting the civil liberties of Montana. So I think it's a pretty good balance. All right. We're going to hold it there. Nancy and Billings will be coming up soon as well. Quick break. Your phone calls uh, on this bill limiting the use of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles here in Montana. Heard at the legislature earlier this week. We want to hear from you. Back with more right after this quick break. So as we talk about uh, this bill that would place certain restrictions on unmanned aerial vehicles here in Montana, you know, I'm I'm reading more of the testimony from Brendan O'Connor, Billings native, talking about, you know, for less than $1,000, any person can own a powerful multi-copter, helicopter-type device with many separate propellers that allow it to hover in place for minutes or hours while capturing video, audio, and even thermal images. And you can, of course, some folks have even not figured out ways to weaponize it. Well, he also adds that science rushes on. Onward, successful, uh, successfully mounting remote control electronics on biological flying insects and creating fully auto- artificial robots that look like natural hummingbirds in both size and appearance. Imagine, imagine that showing up at your little hummingbird feeder there in Kalispell all of a sudden. Oh, look at that cute hummingbird. Actually, that's a drone, and we're watching you. Uh, Harvard University, sorry to, if that sounds like I'm joking about it. Anyway, Harvard University has even developed a bee-styled UAV that assembles like a pop-up book and has a body smaller than a penny. Well, all this is in the written testimony submitted to the legislature this week from Brendan O'Connor. Uh, he's got a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science with a research focus on computer security from Johns Hopkins and also has a company, Malice 
Afterthought, which is a Montana corporation performing computer security research on behalf of businesses and the government. It's testified and multi- presented at multiple computer security conferences, uh, et cetera, and actually done research confre- uh, contracts for DARPA, which is a long-range research group of, of the Department of Defense. What are your questions? What are your comments? Let's go to Dean and Big Fork on line one listening to KJJR. Good morning, Dean. Good morning, gentlemen. Last night I saw on TV a program about this very thing about drones. It is extensive about uh, all kinds of different ones. And my thought was one of the things they talked about was the ability of people to purchase these small devices with cameras and being able to, one, spy on their neighbors or as many activist groups as we have here in Montana. I saw all kinds of ways that people could follow people. One organization was using them to fly over people's properties and check on their animals. And although I'm concerned about you know, animal welfare, I also don't like, don't like the idea of somebody flying over my house. Yeah. In fact, what, it was over in Pennsylvania, and uh, and the, these radical animal rights groups, environmentalists, uh, they flew their own little uh, drone over the top of a uh, – I think they were, they had like a, a shotgun uh, deal going on uh, right, you know, where right. they were hunting – I forget where they were hunting rabbits or something like that. And Yeah, and so they – yeah, there you go. And so they flew – so the environmentalists flew this drone over it, and the hunters uh, – you know, it became this big issue landing on the Drudge Report because the hunter actually shot it down. <laughs> Uh, Do we expect actually, that same I have thing? To in that the hunter shot it down. Yeah, oh, yeah. Hold, hold on one second, Dean. Go, go, go ahead, real quick. Dean, we'll come back to you too. But uh, go ahead, uh, Brandon O'Connor. Uh, I was going to say the hunters actually shot it down four different times. But uh, we, in both Pennsylvania and in Montana, we have laws to deal with it when private citizens take the law into their own hands like that. The laws of public and private nuisance, and in general, the law of torts. Um, you can simply sue your neighbors if they are harassing your cattle or otherwise invading your property or your privacy. That's a different thing that we can do with the government. Yeah, yeah. So that's why you think, look, there needs to be restrictions on what the government can do. Yeah, Dean, back to you in, in Big Fork. Uh, you had some more thoughts as well. Yeah. I was thinking about some of these controversial bison hunts and different things, and I can just envision some of these uh, people you know, trying to follow hunters with these vehicles just to both harass and to um, photograph and, and whatnot. So I'm just concerned about that type of thing going on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. And I mean, even if, you know, talk, look at how dirty politics is, you know, now that, you know, you, you rival political groups using UAVs to spy on each other. I mean, they, but, you know, exactly right. You know, they want to force somebody off the land because they want, you know, they don't want you ranching there anymore. Well, they can come just harass you with this type of stuff. Yeah, Dean, really appreciate hearing from you. Let's go to Phil in Big Fork as well. Uh, he's on line two listening to KJJR. Good morning, Phil. Yeah, hey, um, I got a call. A couple comments and a, and a question. Um, the comment is, you know, this is really getting scary with the technology and what the government's doing. But uh, as you were mentioned, that these drones will uh, recognize a face, uh, what, 19 miles square? Yes, oh, 19 square there. miles. And, and people have also mentioned, you know, what happens if the government wants to track you down or law enforcement. And I understand keeping uh, people safe from, from criminals, but the government's really focusing on the law by a citizen and keeping us are getting us into a chain, uh, chains and, and, and locking us down, too. Didn't the president uh, sign into law that he can actually, from the Department of Defense, round up anybody that he deems a threat to the country now, even though if you're a United States citizen? That's well, he, really scary with these uh, yeah, drones, too. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks, Phil. I'm really happy that this is being touched upon. All right. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Thanks for your call. Uh, Brendan O'Connor, your thoughts on Phil's question? Well, he, he did sign a law very much like that, I think, with all the details. But remember, unfortunately, that because of the Constitution, states aren't allowed to restrict the federal government and what the federal government can do. All the state can do is say, well, we're not going to do it ourselves. We're going to you know, set a line in the sand. But going back to the earlier point, yes, these drones can be purchased. There's a great one on Amazon that does high-definition video from two different cameras for 300 bucks. You control it with your iPhone, your iPad, or your Android phone. Um, and it's just incredible the kind of video you can get out of it. If you search for Parrot Drone or if you simply scroll through my testimony, you can find links to all the different sorts of video on this. So well, it's certainly possible we could have rival political groups doing this. Well, and let's the tie it. Is that it's illegal. And 
let's tie it back into something like let's take this gun control debate that's going on right now. And uh, you know, the, yesterday they were debating this bill to, pro to protect the confidentiality of people who who have uh, concealed weapons permits here in Montana. Well, let's take it a step further. Let's say all of a sudden Phil and Dean and Nancy, who's going to be up up here shortly on the program, let's say all of them show up at a a Second Amendment rally. Let's say they end up at one in Portland, Oregon, where there's tens of thousands of people there. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, tell us what you can actually do with some of this type of technology just from a drone, at, even at a rally like that. Right. Well, even with a you know simple standard civilian drone, the three hundred dollar toy I mentioned on Amazon, you could certainly collect video and then run them through standard federal law enforcement checks. The difference with the full-out military technology that DHS is sponsoring for use in the United States is that you can do it over the entire city of Portland or the entire almost county of Yellowstone um, all at once and register every state and where they've been and where they're going. Um, so certainly, again, it's another tool that could be used. Um, one of your colleagues earlier mentioned, well, I understand trying to keep people safe, and that's certainly valid. But I'd remind your listeners that we have polygraph technology in the United States, these so-called lie detector tests. But we've decided as a country that it's not valid ever to use that in any court for criminal proceedings because the civil liberties implications are just too damning, even though, yeah, you could probably use it to keep people safe. So we're trying to draw another line similar to the polygraph line here with drones. All right. If you've just recently joined us, we're talking with uh, Billings, Montana native Brendan O'Connor. In fact, I think, Brendan, you're now in law school at the University of Wisconsin, authored yep. Senate Bill 150 for the Rutherford Institute, uh, restricting the use of unmanned aerial, ve aerial vehicles here in Montana. And he's got uh, both a, a master's and an undergrad degree in computer science uh, and is literally presented uh, before the Department of Defense talking about cyber warfare. Uh, Etc. Uh, in cybersecurity, um, so so he knows what he's talking about on a lot of these issues. Uh, uh, let's go to Nancy in Billings on line three, listening to KYYA. Good morning, Nancy. Hi, Aaron. Um, I'm just wondering when you were talking about face recognition for like 19 miles or something like that. What what is the software, and what may be some of the issues with that? Any problems with that kind of face recognition software? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Good question. Brendan, uh, have you looked into that in particular? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the software used by the military drones is, of course, military and classified. But I can tell you there's open source software available for free to anyone developed by academics over the last couple decades that can do much the same work. Uh, the difference is we don't have the 19-square-mile cameras on the academic side. Um, but it's open source software. There's actually some cool research on things like makeup and hairstyles that can allow you to attempt to conceal yourself from this sort of camera. But it's, you know, pretty, unfortunately, infantile research. Uh, the long story short, we need to have laws that restrict the government from doing this rather than simply trying to change our hair to cover up our faces. In fact, earlier this week, uh, Brian Bennett, our producer, was just pulling up on on his computer. You know the fact that that uh, commercial drones outnumber government drones right now. And in fact, yeah. uh, John Whitehead, the president of the Rutherford Institute, uh, they sent out a press release earlier this week talking about uh, at least thirty thousand drones expected to occupy U.S. airspace by twenty twenty. Um, well, let's go to Chris and Big Fork on line one, listening to KJJR as we talk with Brendan O'Connor. Chris, thanks for calling in. Hi, uh, I got some thoughts on this. Let's say we have an amber alert. We know the car. We know a general area could help find a child. Uh, another thing that strikes me, the police know generally who is dealing uh, illicit drugs. They need uh, evidence for them. Uh, generally, if they're dealing hard drugs, they're not getting them in Montana. They travel out of state, and then they come back. There's a lot of uses for the government for this. Uh, and this deal, the black helicopter, the conspiracy things, I don't quite get it. Uh, there's a lot of uses for technology, and by Putting a bill in that says we're going to stick our head in the sand just doesn't make much sense to me. We write we lo a, lots of uses. We have I mean, a judicial system. If you believe you have been wronged, that is where you address it. But 
Law enforcement no, gives the airport. Yeah, Bre- Brendan, hold on. Yeah, hold, hold on. Brendan O'Connor, we're going to get your reaction to that. Uh, Chris, great analogy, too. On If there's an Amber Alert, you've got a missing child. This could help you possibly find that, that child. Also, there's other uses, mapping noxious weeds, helping uh, to get visibility for firefighters when you're fighting a wildfire. We're going to get the reaction uh, to those comments by Brendan O'Connor right after this. All right, just a few minutes left. Very interesting discussion this morning with Brendan O'Connor, the author of Senate Bill 150, being carried by carried by a, a Democratic State Senator Robin Driscoll of Billings. Uh, his testimony actually uh, is sent to the legislature this week uh, uh, regarding a bill limiting the use of unmanned aerial vehicles here in Montana. Uh, let's see. Uh, Want to get, want to get a chance? Uh, I want to get to Mike and Kalispell, and then we've got a phone line open if you want to call in as well at eight six six NBS Live. But I, I do want the opportunity to go back to Brendan O'Connor uh, and respond to Chris's remarks. You know, Chris was talking about all these, you know, positive uses. You know, what if you've got a kid missing? You've got an Amber Alert out there. You've got a vehicle description. You know the general area. Something like these UAVs and this technology could help us find that kid. I mean, by are, are we completely removing, attempting to remove these from? From a, as a capability from the law enforcement perspe- perspective that could have very positive uh, benefits uh, for the state. Well, again, Aaron, um, the problem is that there are lots of technologies we could use that we've decided as a society are simply too dangerous. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not trying to stick my head at the standard technology. I own three of these drones. That's part of how I've learned about them. Um, I have one fixed-wing drone and two multi-copter drones that kind of can hover in place. But to be clear, just like the polygraph exam, the reason we don't lie detector every person or have cameras in every home, even though those could prevent crime, is because we've decided as a society that it's simply too dangerous to do that. It's too deleterious to the Constitution. And, and, you, just right. sim- and you just simply feel that, that having a, a, uh, an exception to where if you've got a, a warrant, that, that, that that's not enough, just that, that having an exception it's, it's for a warrant is not enough? Because of the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, in 1986, passed a case, or excuse me, heard a case, and determined that if you could say you had good faith, quote unquote, uh, that that was good enough, you didn't really need a warrant. And the problem is, due to the way that drone technology works, good faith will prove to be every single time. It's actually impossible to turn off the cameras because if you turn off the cameras on a drone, it flies into a flock of geese or something, or accidentally goes over a hunting area, or in general, it gets into trouble by itself. You can't ever turn off the drones. You're always going to have a good faith exception. So if we allow this to be used sometime, it will be used every single time. All so right. Strenuously oppose that. Only about a couple of minutes left here. I uh, want to go to Mike in Kalispell on line two listening to KJJR. Good morning, Mike. Hey, good morning. Hey, the, you know, the technology is not there. That caller was just out in Lululand. He's the one in the black helicopter. If you If you had an Amber Alert, First of all, you got to launch the UAV, and then you got to get to the – have to fly the craft to that area. And then if you have bad intel from the ground, and you're military, I'm military, we all know that they hyped up back in the 90s our ability for a, a surgical strike. It was guys like me that infiltrated overnight or over a week and hid in the sand somewhere in a hide site with a handheld laser that guided those bombs and missiles into Saddam bunkers. And so the technology is not necessarily there on the civilian side to be able to respond to an Amber Alert. The best intel is people with cell phone cameras, and that's what's going to catch a perp, not a UAV. You would have to have a UAV in the area operated, ready to patrol and go after, and to what happens if it's bad intel? What if they go after a Pinto wagon when it was an SUV? All of a sudden, you've launched your entire operation against the wrong target, and we know that happens quite a bit in Afghanistan and Iraq, but it's not such a big deal because collateral damage is acceptable in a war zone, but this is not a war zone yet, is it? Well, and as you probably know, Mike, as any Iraq veteran could tell you, hey, be on the lookout for a white bongo truck. Hey, gee, thanks for the tip. Yeah, I I just saw about 15 of those in the last 20 seconds, but I'll, I'll be on the lookout. Well, Mike, good to hear from you. Thanks for your service. Only about 30 seconds left. Brendan O'Connor, your final pitch for listeners. A great discussion. Thanks for joining us this morning. Absolutely. Um, I think that your listeners should really be calling their senators, especially because this is still in committee in the judiciary community right now. Um, I would hope that they would call their senators and say, you know what? We think we can make a reasonable differentiation between legitimate military use overseas in Afghanistan or Iraq 
and what we should be flying over our cattle in Montana or flying over hunters in Montana or invading our homes in Montana. We're not a war zone. We don't want to become one. So I hope all of your listeners would call their senators today and tell them to pass Senate Bill 150. All right. Brendan O'Connor, great having you on the show. Tell your dad I said hello. Good to have you. His, his, his mom, much, Teresa, sir. from Northeast Montana, for our listeners there as well. I'm going to get his full or a link to his testimony on the website later today. Stay tuned. You've-